Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. We are offering three conversations from this week's review of the Global Liver Institute's U.S. Nash Action Plan. This conversation is sponsored with a grant from Madrigal Pharmaceuticals. Madrigal is leading the field of Nash therapeutic development with resmeteram, a thyroid receptor beta agonist with potential to address both the liver pathophysiology and fibrosis caused by Nash. In this conversation, the entire group, Stephen Harrison, Louise Campbell, GLI Director of Global Policy, Andrew Scott, Magical Pharmaceuticals Co-Founder, CMO, and President of Research and Development, Rebecca Taub, Central Virginia VA Healthcare System Chief of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Michael Fuchs, and I, share thoughts on the importance of appropriate and timely use of diagnostic tests to identify patients early in the course of disease. International NASH Day is a day for all of us to recommit to improving treatment of NASH. In the U.S., GLI's NASH Action Plan lights the way, and outside the U.S., it shows advocates ways to think about what they can achieve in their own countries. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the discussion on our LinkedIn and Facebook discussion groups. Now that the events of International NASH Day are over, join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, Madrigal Pharmaceuticals co-founder, CMO and President of Research and Development Becky Taub, Central Virginia VA Health System Director of Hepatology and Key Opinion Leader Dr. Michael Fuchs and Global Liver Institute Director of Policy Andrew Scott as they discuss GLI's U.S. NASH Action Plan today on Surfing the NASH Tsunami. Yeah, I I would just like to touch on one point that uh, Stephen made on that awareness aspect. I think that the thought still among many of the primary care physicians, and even in what they tell the patients, is that they don't raise any alarms about their patient's liver unless these patients have very high liver enzymes. And we know that in most cases, NASH doesn't lead to liver enzyme elevations that are above what is called the upper limit of normal. In fact, when we we look at our phase three data, and these are all advanced NASH patients with significant liver fibrosis, only about 10 or 15 percent of those patients who have biopsy-confirmed NASH fibrosis have significantly elevated liver enzymes that are one and a half, two-fold or more over the upper limit of normal. And so, it's really very important to think about how we can diagnose NASH and get people to learn about that they may have higher risk of having significant liver disease than may be apparent from looking at some of the simple lab tests we have. I'd be interested if Michael, Steve, and others on the call would comment on that. Yeah, if I can make a couple of comments. We, we all understand how critical education is and awareness. And while that is is correct. It has to start you know, at the level of school. As a provider, we need to focus, particularly when I'm looking at, at my organization, how can I have the, the biggest impact? And the biggest impact in terms of addressing education is you know, reaching out to primary care because probably different to other healthcare systems, you know, many of the comorbidities like diabetes are treated you know, by, by primary care and not necessarily only by the endocrine so we really have to reach out to primary care to teach them, but also make them good teachers to teach their patients because hepatology or specialists cannot take on the large number of patients in terms of educating. So we need to get primary care on board and provide them with the tools that they can, after they have been educated and understand the impact of NAFLD, to train and teach their patients. And NAFLD is is not very high on the priority list of primary care. And when we talk about educating primary care, we also have to be mindful that we'll find a good way that is palatable for primary care 
to actually listen to what you're telling them, particularly if you consider all the mandates they have to meet. So having a good access to primary care and getting them on board is very crucial. And we need to present it not only to primary care, but also to our healthcare system leadership that MAPLD should have at least the similar priorities related to GI like colorectal cancer screening. All of you brought up such amazing and great points, and I think it really underlines the truth about this action plan is that it's not necessarily recreating the wheel. We really were hoping to, and I'm, I'm glad that we're all so in alignment here, is we really were just hoping to capture the viewpoints of what is already out there. So as Luis mentioned, we're talking about family-based education, ensuring that that is a recommendation for patient advocacy organizations to create educational materials that are targeted at full family-based education. Or as Michael mentioned, educating primary care providers. That's recommendation for clinician. But then also, we're talking about barriers for the future. We're trying to think holistically here. Patient is, you know, the, the most critical point. We could not agree more so about initially, but then also ensuring that there are not barriers in the future. As Stephen and Roger mentioned, the, the lack of therapies until the hopeful approval of, of a couple recently, you know, there hasn't been anything. And it, working to ensure that regulators and recommendations for those regulators, that barriers are removed or that they understand the future yield appropriately is also vital. So there are just so many pieces that go into this, but I think it's great that there's so much alignment here and that the action plan is really just putting these points, uh, these amazing points into words, which is exciting. Andrew, that's great. And as I was listening, I was making notes about a couple of comments people made that I think are practical and amazingly helpful. For example, Becky used the phrase liver enzymes in a situation where a lot of people would use the phrase liver function tests. But the reality is something that has minimal relationship to the actual performance of the liver is not a function test, it's an enzyme, right? So simply getting the language changed so that everybody speaks the way that Becky does instead of the way many other people do seems like nothing is simple. But a relatively straightforward way to maybe reduce some of the comfort level that primary care physicians, for example, might have when they see a ALT or AST level, ALT level notably, that that's normal in, in, in a patient that has challenge was one thought. But second thought I had, and this moves into your next priority about what makes it easier, is the whole issue beyond the biopsy and getting better and more widely accepted and easier to use tests to screen. I guess any of us could talk about that, but would you like to comment about that? And then I want to throw it out to the group to talk about beyond the biopsy a little bit. Sure. Yes. As one of our recommendations in the plan, essentially for ourselves or for patient advocacy organizations, is to assist in this movement in shifting away from biopsy. And this is really where our initiative beyond the biopsy kind of came to be. And really the focus has kind of been very much to your point, removing as many barriers as possible and essentially advocating for using whatever diagnostic that, you know, is proven to be effective, but using whatever diagnostic is available to reach the proper conclusion while not having to stick a needle in someone's body that is subject to sampling variability and a variety of other issues, obviously is extremely invasive and burdensome on the patient. I'm sure Donna would mention, you know, sitting there for, for hours in the operating chair waiting to get a, a bio biopsy is not fun for any patient to say the least. So that only adds to our push there. But again, really central to this is how can we simplify this so that we can diagnose the liver earlier and effectively to then get to the prevention aspects or get to addressing fatty liver disease or NASH as early as possible. So really, it's been an ongoing initiative. We were very excited talking about having more uh, congressional champions involved Last year, we had multiple members of Congress give opening remarks to a few different briefings on moving beyond the biopsy. And then we've also done a variety of other kind of continuing medical education in partnership with some of the medical societies we've previously mentioned on moving beyond the biopsy and more. So it's exciting to think about where it will go next. And then also, I just will briefly mention, and this is a slight side note, but talking about the language of NASH, there's a lot of confusion or not confusion necessarily, but disagreement on how to talk about NASH or the terminology that should be used. That was a, another recommendation for patient advocacy organizations in our, in our plan, but we did release the language of NASH. 
uh, which essentially provides that messaging framework, which touches on some of your points as well, Roger. But, you know, kind of both of these initiatives are really kind of getting to some of these other issues as well that we see in the field of NASH. Luis, and Stephen touch on this stuff from time to time. Interested in your thoughts about the importance of beyond the biopsy and or the language of NASH in terms of getting everybody to a stronger and more common ground on understanding what the disease is and what we can do about that. I think the language we use often in the medical profession or in the kin and associated areas is sometimes a little bit too medical, I suppose. I know numerous patients who can have their letters, their discussions for years and years, and it says cirrhosis all over it. But when you come to discuss cirrhosis with them, they don't understand what it means. So I think we do have to make language understandable. We have to explain it in ways, in different ways for different people to understand how they can make changes. And I think it's one of the key aspects to engaging any individual. I very rarely, and in fact, I can't think of an opportunity where I've not scanned a child or an adolescent who's got fatty liver disease with any of the parents there who haven't then gone on immediately to change something in the diet, as simple as full fat Cokes or the high fructose drinks or a bit of McDonald's nearly every day or every part of the week. And just understanding that small differences can change in that language. They're not going to try and cure it all at that moment in time. And a lot of the sense that I get, and I don't know about the others, is that people are looking for quick and complete resolution in something that's taken a number of years to develop. There's a sense of panic, a sense of anxiety that as health professionals, we can allay those fears and give a time frame and every little movement forward helps. Just getting that understanding is one of the key and first steps that I spend time doing with our clients. I agree with Louise often, and I agree with her here as well. I, I think the issue of this beyond the biopsy is, is really getting at how do we make it easier for providers to render a diagnosis of NASH and then begin to institute treatment paradigms. And clearly, we need to get beyond the biopsy. When I talk to providers, the excuse that, that was raised and has been raised for many, many years has been, when you bring me a treatment, Dr. Harrison, I will begin to work up my patients. Well, well, we're on the verge of having a treatment, but the paradigm has shifted a bit. The pendulum has shifted a bit based on the increasing prevalence and severity of disease. We can't afford to just sit back and tell our patients to casually lose weight and exercise and not be prescriptive with a more carefully crafted care plan for these individuals. And that care plan includes making a more accurate diagnosis so that we can appropriately give them a proper prognosis. Because without making the right diagnosis, we're shooting from the hip and shooting in the blind as to how our patients are going to be five, 10 years from now. And I don't want to be the provider that tells a patient there's nothing to worry about, lose a little weight and exercise, and this will not be an issue for you. And I don't want others to be in that same boat either. So we have to get beyond the biopsy. There are some simple things we can do in the clinic to really identify at-risk individuals from simple things like identifying patients with diabetes or diabetes and obesity or metabolic syndrome with or without elevated liver enzymes. And this gets back to that three-legged stool because we're going to need societies to help modify the guidance documents that are out there to begin to advocate for screening in our high-risk populations. And then we can talk about what is screening? What does that involve? Is it a blood-based test? Is it an imaging modality? Is it a combination of both of those? We know that gives us a better positive predictive value. Any one of these alone has a high negative predictive value. Education around what those imaging and blood-based biomarkers are would also be important. So there's a lot to, to do here. Maybe even more than education and awareness is coming to an agreement on how to appropriately diagnose and triage patients with fatty liver. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We will be back on Wednesday, June 16th with our second preview episode for Digital ILC 2021. We will have U.S. and European opinion leaders will be part of the Congress coverage team. They are with us at that point at that time. We will be back on Wednesday, June 16th with our second preview episode of Digital ILC 2021. We will have U.S. and European opinion leaders will be part of our Congress coverage team there with us. 
I hope you join us then. Until then, stay safe. Surf on. See you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.